Hello, everybody. Welcome to Answers, Special Education Today for June 9th, 2022. I'm Kevin Daly for PATH. In this edition of Answers, there will be a school report by yours truly. Our information specialist, Audra Talbot, will talk with community act activist, Doris Maldonado Mendez. As always, there will be time for Q&A towards the end. Just use the Q&A and chat buttons on your screen. Answers is brought to you by PATH. PATH is a nonprofit organization that supports Connecticut families of children with special needs. And we've been doing it for over 35 years. If you have any questions about this webinar, please contact me directly by email at kdaily at pathct.org. While you're online, be sure to visit our website and follow us on Facebook and Twitter, and be sure to check out the PATH channel on YouTube, where you'll find past editions of this webinar. And now the fine print. This webinar should not be regarded as legal advice or healthcare advice, or advice of any kind. It's the sole property of PATH and not to be used for any other purpose without permission. And if you do, I just might pay you a visit. Here's the school report. Let's go back in time. The date is two years ago, June 2020. Schools across the nation were closed, except for a handful of schools in Montana and Wyoming. Here in Connecticut, all schools were closed, as they had been since March. Schools would remain closed for the rest of the academic school year, which was on June 30th on that year. At the time, PPT and 504 meetings, they were allowed on an as-needed basis. Typically, meetings were allowed for students who were changing schools or who were outplaced in schools, in private schools. The kind of meetings that didn't take place were routine meetings and meetings to refer students for services. Referrals depend on evaluations, and at the time, all evaluations were on hold until after the schools reopen. School meetings, when they were allowed, took place online, giving parents the first taste of Google Meet or Zoom or Teams. In fall 2020, our schools started the year with these three learning models we came to know so well, full in-person learning, full remote learning, and hybrid learning. Plus, students could out, opt out of in-person learning entirely. By the first day of school in 2020, not even a third of Connecticut schools were open for full in-person instruction. And about a quarter of all the students had opted for full remote instruction. In larger cities like Bridgeport and New Haven, the rate was as high as 50%. By November, 2020, the number of schools offering full in-person instruction rose. It rose from less than a third to a little more than half, and 9% of the students were on full remote instruction. By April, about 75% had shifted to full-time in-person instruction, and the number of schools on full remote instruction was down to only 6%. This continued for the rest of the school year. On the last day of April in 2021, the State Department of Ed announced that remote learning would be phased out in the fall and public schools were expected to open for full in-person learning with many, many precautions, including masks and face coverings. When schools reopened in fall 2021, it was a difficult time. Some students were going to school for the first time in nearly two years. There were high school sophomores who had never set foot in their high school, grade two students whose only in-person experience was kindergarten. Of course, over the course of the school year, the effect of the last two years on students with disabilities became clearer. For example, early in the school year, we saw the results of the first statewide achievement testing since the pandemic started, testing that me measured basic academic skills like reading, writing, and math. Statewide, the proficiency of all students was down compared to previous years, 
especially for students who attended school remotely, even part of the time. The scores show that students with high needs, like students with disabilities, were impacted even more than their typical peers, especially those who attended school remotely. Starting earlier on this year, signs of the crisis in student behavioral health began to manifest in our schools. High rat rates of absenteeism, school refusal, bullying, destruction of school property. Many of students, students with disabilities were already dealing with high levels of anxiety when school started. The uptight atmosphere in their schools this year tended to magnify these difficulties. Many school employees moved on to greener pastures when school ended in June 2021, and they didn't come back causing a shortage of teachers and staff that made this year difficult, if not impossible, for schools to live up to their responsibilities to students with disabilities. Schools were caught short on teachers, staff, paraeducators, even bus drivers, to the point where some schools had to shut down for a day or two due to personnel shortages. Now with the end of the school year so close, it's too late to remedy all these troubles. What will happen next year after summer break? Well, in a few minutes, I'll be back with some predictions for next year. But first, a conversation with Audra Talbot and Doris Maldonado Mendez about advocating for our children in this age of uncertainty. Audra and Doris spoke earlier. Let's listen in on their conversation. Hi, and thank you for joining us tonight on Answers. My name is Audra Talbot. And tonight I have Doris Maldonado Mendez with us, who is a community activist. And Doris, thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you, Audra. Doris, could you tell us a little bit about your background and your activities throughout the state of Connecticut? Uh, I am the PATH statewide bilingual health information specialist, certified community health worker, and uh, new public policy liaison. And throughout Connecticut, I'm a certified teacher, uh, foster parent, adoptive parent, and guardian ad litem for children in placement. And I'm on several boards along with you and, and at the Children's Hospital um, for mental health. I'm the co-chair of KTP, as well as the vice chair of the Connecticut Developmental Disabilities Council. Yeah, you have your plate full. I entirely understand. <laughs> Have kids. I'm glad to have you here. Oh yeah, and we're mothers too. <laughs> yeah, that's the first. Um, that's so, so I'm so glad to have you here tonight because I wanted to ask you some questions regarding the Latino community. That was the first part, and then also a lot of my families that I work with are Spanish-speaking families. They're, you know, that's the first language, and I've personally found as the, you know, working with these families that. There's such a there's such a gray area between the school system and what our parents are the information they're getting in their language, which I think is imperative if you're a fluent Spanish speaker and that's your first language. Um, so, if you want to tell me, what are you running into? Let's start there. What I've run into, um, I was born with this. So I've been dealing with this or, or living with, with these challenges all of my life. And that's why I, I, I became a teacher and an advocate. What, what I'm coping with or what the Latino community is, is, is contending with is not something new and unfamiliar to native speakers and people born here in, in the States. It's a, a language issue at times uh, for plain language. It's not even because it's a different than language a foreign language, but the plain language and the inclusivity and access for parents to know what exactly the system is allowing and empowering for them and the laws that um, empower us as parents, it's more of a, of a, a quandary and, and, it, and an impact on the systems that be. So it's it's us and them um, as a Latina and, and um, I'm the first generation in my in my family and my brother. Uh, my parents were born in Puerto Rico. So what we what we face culturally is that um, we were taught that there's a div division between state 
education, religion, and, and the family. So my parents were taught not, not to, to trust the systems, um, to educate and do the best that they could. However, when it comes to disabilities, there's a, there's a very gray, gray area um, in terms of, of uh, politics, um, rights. And if you're a, an immigrant in the States, then that's, that provides another level, an impact and a disadvantage, um, a barrier, for, uh, let's say, for, for families and children in the educational system. So Doris, my next question for you is what I've found lately and a lot of either the phone calls or the conversations I'm having with, you know, my fellow colleagues, especially at CPAC, um, everyone's getting a lot of phone calls because referrals are coming from pediatricians to families, you know, and, and, and then there's this like gray zone that's happening, like this drop down in the schools aren't getting those referrals. That's the first part. And then the school's responsibility is to evaluate in all areas of suspected disability, which is the ideal law, you know, it's child find. And that's not happening. So a lot of the kids that do not have like your multi-disabilities and, you know, your very se severe cases of autism, you know, impacting them in school, a lot of the kids are falling through the cracks. And, and then the second part of that is um, some parents, the Latino community, Latino community, are almost afraid to speak up to the schools because they, they don't want to come off as disrespectful. That's how it was explained to me. But they're not sure what to ask for. Are you getting any questions or have any concerns about that aspect of education? I have re I have re received several communications and parents. I've I've worked with several parents um, throughout the years and especially uh, COVID and beyond COVID. And there seems to be not only the div digital divide for many of our marginalized communities, including the the Latina communities, and there is a cultural component, as you were mentioning, about you know not wanting to. Um, contact the schools or, or being concerned about what, whether or not to contact schools. And, and that's a, a universal concern. Um, there are the cultural components where parents are, are, are oftentimes feel to, uh, felt to blame for a child's disability or challenges. So there, there's so much going on there. And then you have um, the issues with COVID and access to, to the technology um, and lack of access to technology in, in many of our, our marginalized communities. So I, I have received um, several and have been in several conversations with different families. Now, Spanish has over 10 different dialects and sometimes we can't be into the, be in, in, involved and enveloped into that Google Translate um, uh, misconception. So you have these 10 different dialects and my master's degree is in foreign language and in Spanish. Um, and it was my native language. So I am, I'm understanding of those dialects. However, school systems and the systems that be aren't aware of that are privy to that. Um, you take in addition to that, the legislate the legal the legal uh, language behind, oh, well, you know, I'm supposed to uh, count on my, my pediatrician or my primary care provider for my child. But if the provider, what I've experienced personally, the providers, I have to talk to the providers. I have to address my concerns with the provider or the pediatrician, and then they may assess. Um, that assessment may be to pursue special education or support. That would involve the parent going to the school system because there's not a transfer and a, and a and a communication between the school and the, the pediatrician. There are laws to, 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 to be had. Um, I've also experienced that in the uh, transition for high school, out of transition with got transition. Um, there's not that easy, you would think, that the, the, the educational system and, and the medical system would combine and provide, try to provide that wraparound. Um, service for the family to better engage and empower the family and the child, that doesn't happen. So it's not until the parent thinks, oh, I think there's something going on or, you know, just a, an evaluation and then the, the um, pediatrician tells you take this to the school, you take it to the school and they have to do their own testing. The, the provider doing their own testing, 
it's different types of testing and it's it's overwhelming for uh, families, especially families in, in the Latina community, community that we're ha we have over three or four jobs at a time. And that's just, um, uh, that's, that's just data driven uh, basically. And then we're with a minor they're with a majority nationally, 16% of us um, of Latino communities are in, in the United States and we're the you know the, we're the majority, but we we still suffer with the 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 language barrier with the cultural responsiveness. And it isn't until we come in contact, well I've seen, uh, with these organizations that are on the, you know, boots on the ground and, and with lived experiences that help us along. Some providers are being are being um, groomed or um, are experiencing that that lack of um, transition or 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 services between you know um, a mentoring between the medical, then the parent, and then the school system. So um, many parents are are even go to their faith based organizations seeking help and seeking for provisions and oftentimes they're they're scared because there's also the the scare of DCF involvement um, although that shouldn't be a, a bad thing um, sometimes DCF can offer services to families but you know for the most part any um, culturally any participation of the government in our families has been detrimental historically so there's there's that that bridge to divide and that path to take whether or not you want to take it or families are are really strongly encouraged by another person with lived experience to do so. Yeah, it so I think so well said because it, there is just there's a drop down between the medical community who's pediatricians you know for saying that and then the evaluation team at the school getting that special education referral for those kids that need those evaluations in order if, if they do qualify for special education there's no way to know because we're not able to evaluate them so those are the kids that fall through our cracks and and so me personally what i'm seeing is the kids that are falling through the cracks there's behaviors now that now they're positioned as a behavioral problem in the schools and then they grow out grow out of the school and then keep going from there and there's a majority of kids that are you know severely dyslexic and have reading problems and they've adapted but they never got the help they needed because they were the behavior kids so that's what i'm seeing and that it drives me batty because these are the kids that fall through the cracks that we should be proactive about and actually, uh, Audra, unfortunately, this has been going on for, for decades and as long as before I was even born, um, especially in, in BIPOC communities, the, the go to would be, you know, that's a behavioral issue and that for, that child is being bad and intentionally bad. Um, because also uh, what we don't take into account as parents, and I didn't realize that really until I, I went into the educational system, um, is that teachers are given only but so many tools in their toolbox. They go to school, we become certified um, and licensed, and we're only, maybe you get two classes um, introductory to special education. Um, and then that's even limited. So teachers don't have the tools in their toolbox, they don't have the supports, and then we have you know, these, these behaviors or actually development. It's not really develop um, um, behaviors, I would say. It's developmental um, growth, and whether or not it fits into that, you know, perfect box is a different story. Especially with with everything, the socioeconomic challenges that that many of our families face. So, it you know, if you wouldn't mind, could you share um, what your role is? One of your roles, if if you wouldn't mind, and the interaction you have with the community. Well, I'm a, I'm a certified community health worker, so and a health information specialist for PATH for the most for the for, for that. Um, let's start with that. So that entails health as um, as not only being um, related to providers or finding insurances or um, 
finding a special, a, um, a specific type of specialist. It also entails the educational system because health is intertwined with education, despite um, many people arguing, um, arguing it. But so what I do is I find resources. Um, I am assigned families or I assign families that are Spanish speaking or English speaking or bilingual, um, uh, many of them, and uh, try to assess. I make an assessment based on their needs, where their concerns are, where they've been, what has happened. And usually it's, it's a wraparound because it's, it's not only they come to me and they're asking questions about health and uh, providers and it's all encompassing. So it stems from pediatrics. So speaking with pediatricians, their provider, child's a provider, and then the specialist. And then um, sometimes birth to three is involved. Sometimes the foster care system, DCF is involved. And then making sure that that transfers over and that the, the, that the parents, the families, um, be, and the caregivers, because they're not only biological families, um, the caregivers are informed of what their rights are, regardless of, of, of um, citizenship status, but what their rights are and what their child's rights are to get service, to access the services. Where are the services? There's, there are so many limitations and wait lists. So that, that's all encompassing. Um, and that's what I'm seeing. And that's, I get a lot of those calls. I've been getting more frequent calls from the urban areas um, statewide, uh, from Bridgeport, from Waterbury, from, I've, I've always received um, uh, referrals from, from Hartford and, and New Britain, but more in the Bridgeport and um, Waterbury areas, New Haven also and it's it's a it's an increasing population of 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 migrant parents and families but not only exclusively um more so um during covid that i've been uh, receiving calls and referrals because there is a, a a great um reduction in the services they've been impact the children have been impact their educational um progress has been impact impacted yeah so i I agree. Like the, so, the uptake of calls that I've been getting it, it, in all my roles, I'll say, you know, because you know, I have a couple hats I wear, of course. Um, not so much around me because I'm up in in Harford County, but more exactly what you said: New Haven, Bridgeport, yeah, Waterbury, couple. Um, but it's all the same. It's. There, you know, a lot of the times parents have their PPT meetings, there's no interpreter present. Ding, ding, ding. There's, you know, I, I'm a big believer that there should be an interpreter and be an advocate there, two separate people, because from what I've learned from my colleague at CPAC was you can't do both. It's really hard to do both because you're using different sides of your brain to do it, right? Yep. And, and so that, that with Kevin and I have done that when he's at a when he's at a, a PPT and it's a Spanish speaking family and right. I've asked for an interpreter because I'm not there to interpret I'm there for the family and to to support and advocate for the family and there's a difference and oftentimes what happens is that not only do they not inform the parents of their rights to have an interpreter but sometimes they they're they're so um they're so short change at the school systems and the and the educators that are trying to to do the right thing right behind the students but they're bringing in they're pulling out a teacher from her class sending in a para or a sub so that the spanish speaking teacher or any other language that that's needed um that that is is um offered during the ppt so mm -hmm. that student may suffer because that teacher may not be um, readily accessible. Then she's she or he um, they're they're stepping away and they they have to put a substitute in their classroom. So those students are suffering. Um, and then teachers are not um, as versed as as you know. May, I've, I ha I have twins, so I'm speaking from experience. I've had PPTs where my one child's name is in the other, you know, IP and the one diagnosis for the other. And I've had other other students' names in my in my child's um, IP, not even the twins, their the, the siblings' names. 
So there's a lot to be said behind preparation, education, and you know, really experience in that process of interpretation for the families about the families and the child. Yeah, it's it, it. I think that's across the board here. I mean, yes, there's staffing issues. I get it. You know, because we're all kind of recovering from PTSD from COVID, and it's still happening, of course. Um, but still, you know, there, there's a right that families have, and they deserve to have the appropriate services given to them for, for whatever that is. You know, whether it's putting the right name in the IEP or having appropriate interpretation and translation translation of reports even and right. that yet another conversation I have with my colleague about this and you know then we get into the the weeds about the uh, guidance on this the OSEP guidance that stated vital vital reports or what is vital information I think that for a parent to understand the report yeah yeah sure it's yeah. the they have to do the IEP but it, it, you know in order to have it a comprehensive report translated for a parent and then talk to that about their advocate and be able to communicate effectively, that's vital for a parent parental participation. And so yet another thing we ran into. So those interpreters, those people, um, bless them all, uh, those interpreters at, the, oh, at these meetings, at these school meetings, um, mm -hmm. even at the doctor's offices, um, they're expected because many of those documents and those testings aren't legally authorized to be translated because it's a legal document. Um, where they're left on, on on their own recognizance to translate and interpret what's being given and what's being said and what's being stipulated in those legal terms without any legal background in it, any legal transfer um, translation. Um, education on that. So then that further ostracizes and, and furthers the uh, family from, from getting the services for their child and furthers that child as well. Yeah, right. And, and the word that was used was isolated. The, the, the families feel isolated. And so they feel it's, it's a fear of speaking up because they don't want to rock the boat. And at the end of the day, it's the school district not doing the due diligence. That's what it comes down to, it, in my opinion, my humble opinion, of course. Um, so that, there was something that was a question that I wanted to cover. It was regarding medication, like ADHD medications. And I just want parents to know their right to this, right? This is, yeah. It, so the school should never be recommending medication. I personally don't think that actual named medication should, should be an AIP. I don't think that. You know, and, and so I make sure for my clients and for my own children, that's not in there because that's, you know, that's confidential information. That's HIPAA. That's different. Well, not only that, also that that's a, a perfect um, reason why, one of the reasons why, but mm -hmm. school, um, school staff are not authorized. They're not licensed. They're not doctors. They're not providers of, of, of municipal providers. Um, in order to give a diagnosis to suggest that medication is necessary. So that's, that's illegal. And I've, con I've been in contact with attorneys because that happened to me. And today um, I'm coming in from a neuro neurodevelopmental pediatrician's um, meeting uh, appointment for my four-year-old and mm -hmm. she's been diagnosed. Mm -hmm. um, her pre-K teacher suggested that she needs medication and that is not her right, nor is it her privilege to do so um, because I went to the, to, to the directors and I said, you have a lawsuit pending because to diagnose a child, you need to have the backing and the licensure to do so. You are not to tell me or suggest that my child needs medication. That mm -hmm. is for a physician to do so. And oftentimes people do it in the best of, with the best of intentions, but that leads to a very bad path. Um, and that leads to very um, concerned and overly concerned parents that fear for you know, the, the, the idea of medication for a four-year-old or a five-year-old or any age 
um, is is definitely of concern. As, for me as a parent, I don't ever want to hear. I'm on on my I'm on so many medications necessarily, um, but I don't want to hear that about my 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 child unless you have a, a, a diagnosis, you've done the testing, you've done the blood work, all of that encompassing. But not not all of our families know that. So they're trusting, they're very trusting, either they're very trusting or very distrust, trustful. So that's mm -hmm. what we come to terms with. Yeah, I, it, you nailed it. Because I think that there is that line between the medical diagnosis and the educational identification for special education. Right here, yeah. Um, and, and as teachers, as teachers, sorry to interrupt you, I'm so passionate no, about this. But as teachers, yeah. thank you. <laughs> Um, as teachers, we're taught universal design for learning. So we make sure that in our minds when we're setting a, a plan, a, a class plan, um, that we are, we are making sure that we're teaching to the most needs. So we're making sure the best that we can as possible because we're human, that we're making our, 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 our program, our class and our um, our time with students, the most accessible for the most um, challenged uh, um, student. So by doing that from top down, instead of from bottom up, uh, from top down, so make sure that it's accessible for everyone as best as you can. And then, you know, everyone will follow suit uh, if, you, if, you, if you do it the right way. Um, so with that in mind, that should be at the top of everyone's list. It's it's easier said than done, but in order for, for me to, or a parent to receive a diagnosis um, from an educator saying, I think your kid needs to be on medication. There's also the problem with my families and my communities, the Latina communities and the BIPOC communities. Our, our, our children are the, the most that are, are, are overly diagnosed, misdiagnosed and mm. treated as a behavioral issue um, or, or ostracized and sent into, you know, the abyss of uh, special education, IEPs and 504s really. Um, so that's, and that's all data driven. That's in, in the books that our, 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 our children are the most that are sent off with diagnosis and misdiagnosed. And that's why many of them, um, there are such a large majority of, of juveniles in the justice system because of that, because they've been misdiagnosed and um, they have been challenged and not and not have their their needs met um, by yeah. the educational and other systems. Yeah, that's the school to prison pipeline, and that is that is one of my top priorities as an advocate. Is and and I think it all falls back on that early intervention identification, doing things the right way. And so this leads into my next part with you, Doris. Is that so? How do we? As this next generation of advocates, we are advocates. We're, you know, you you said that. I remember one of the first times I've ever met you. That was the first thing you called yourself. You were a mother and you're an advocate, and that's exactly how I, you know, portray myself. But how, so, what do we do? Like, do we do we train our families younger, especially our Spanish-speaking communities? Do, how do we get? How do we? make this divide smaller? What do we do? How do we build that bridge for them so we get more kids treated appropriately? That's a hard question, isn't it? <laughs> that is a hard question and, and age has brought some wisdom to me. Um, although I, I fight against it one day at a time. It has, we have to do it one day at a time, one individual at a time. Um, you and I are on our many boards um, in the state. I'm on, on over 10 different uh, statewide and national boards and um, task forces because of the disabilities, because of inclusion and um, what we can do for our young. Uh, I work with the, the, the early um, the, um, maternal and infancy groups. Um, as much as I can, especially in the marginalized groups and the urban areas, I reach out to them. PATH is, 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 is known for 36 years being there and, and, and reaching out to provide services for families and trainings. Um, so starting from 
the maternal and infancy. And actually, we're 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 at CCMC. I'm I'm on the FAC, the Family Advisory Council and Behavioral Team. But we're with um, newborn and and genetics. We're working with those families. However, it's it's not how do we, but how do the families access us? How do the families know? Because we're all in silos still. Um, COVID brought us many of us together, but we're still the organizations are still um, struggling. So how do we reach out? So I reach out through uh, Spanish radio, through um, uh, the, the newspapers, because not everyone's on social media. I am not on social media purposely. Um, so I am reaching out with faith-based groups. Um, so that's how the Latine community works. Uh, the trusted messengers that, that are in the communities that are vested and we go from inside to outside. Um, so that's, that's what we've been doing at Path and what I've been doing. And actually as a single mom and a person with disabilities, I was, I was faced at a first IEP for my children when I moved to Connecticut um, and a psychiatrist evaluated my sons to see what diagnosis they would, they would be giving them. And my son was seen for five minutes by a psychiatrist and he right away diagnosed him with, with reactive attachment disorder because he was in foster care and that was a false, a wrong diagnosis. D uh, diagnosed him with ASD and in the IEP, in the uh, uh, IEP form, he did. The, um, he described me as a single mom um, from the ur an urban area and Latina. I think it was Hispanic at the time. Um, a single Hispanic mom from from New York City, and that is something awful to to lead what with, because we were already stigmatized, um, and so we can't we can't do that. And that's what we we have. It's it's in our power and. And I think that thanks, thanks to Kevin, um, I saw him many years ago, I had that opportunity and privilege to hear about Special Education Day at the Capitol, I, to hear about PATH. Um, so reaching out um, is, not, is not the answer all. I heard some from someone uh, uh, the other day, we need to, to reach out more. No, it's not reaching out because people know that we're there or that you're there. It's not to reach out, it's to embed yourself. Make sure that you're engaging in that community. No matter what color you are, engage in that community. And with that consistency, like with our children, be consistent and be present. And then we can sit at a table and have a discussion on how to better serve our communities and move forward. Doris, you just taught me something new. This is the, so I believe in learning something new every day of my life, right? I, I'm fortunate that way because I have that positive mindset. I learn it from my children. I learn it from my clients. I learn it from- You're an amazing mom. So you, you get the prize today in embedding in the community. Because I've always thought, you know, I'm here. I don't, you know, we don't advertise ourselves. You know, people just kind of find us when they need us, when they're in crisis. But- the proactive way of doing that, which you just said, is embedding yourself in the faith-based communities into the, you know, the whatever community, whatever your, you know, community you're entwined with. But that's that's um, thank you because I didn't I didn't think of that. I'm embedding myself now. Um, okay, so <laughs> resources. This is this is my favorite part of. Um, the interview. So where can families, and I'm going to put this into a document, and then we'll be able to send it out to people when we say that this webinar is posted on YouTube, but just even if you have one or two resources for our families, because I know a couple of families I work with will be watching this tonight, and I want them to know that there are resources, but, you know, of course, we're not able to embed ourselves in these resources, but what could you recommend as far as, I have a couple families that do not speak English and it's it's purely Spanish. I don't know what dialect it is. I don't know if it's being interpreted to them appropriately now. So now it's something for me to think about. What, what do you recommend families should start off with if they have questions? They should start off with their pediatrician because the pediatrician's office definitely should be providing next steps. Um, 
if they have a faith-based community, if they have a faith, um, then that's the, another step. But definitely PATH um, is my go-to. I've been, I've met PATH uh, a year after I moved to Connecticut. And that was in 2007. Um, my wow. goodness. So 2009, about 2008, 2009 that I met PATH. And um, I've been with them for since then, basically as a parent, and then I was hired and then board. But PATH has many paths and connections and um, works with several um, statewide. So that's, and it's free. A lot of families think that, and especially with the advocacy part that we're going into the school systems, helping the parent, some people charge $150 an hour. That's $150 an hour that I don't have and I can spend on my child. Um, or for groceries and, and rent. So PATH has uh, wonderful services. Um, another thing is that this is not, unfortunately, this is not being um, offered in Spanish, but oh, that's wow. that's another next step, um, or at least closed captioning um, for those providers and, and people out there, organizations out there that are trying to embed. Um, you're doing nothing but reaching out and then you're not getting the, the, the right, the correct messaging and, and resources out. Another organization that, that has helped um, is Family Voices. National Family Voices has a plethora um, in, in multiple languages and especially Spanish. Um, they have a plethora of information for be, um, beyond the health information, educational information, genetics. Um, we have New England Regional Genetics Network also for those diagnoses when we're on the, you know, we're not too sure, sure and the doctor just gave us a diagnosis for, for our child. They also have bilingual, they even have trainings now because I translated their, their GEMS trainings, um, their genetics trainings. Um, so they offer those as well. Parent to Parent USA has a phenomenal amount of resources on online. Now these are all online, so our families need to have access to, to that and know um, and be informed of that. Um, community health centers, we've reached out to many community health centers and given us given them that, that uh, information. We also have a national uh, siblings network. Our children's children, the uh, siblings need those supports. So these are all networks out there that are, are ready and willing to, to reach out. Got transition for those of us who are, are, who are um, happy about and, and scared, um, concerned for a child's you know, next steps for transition. National Got Transition now is, is working on having that translated and, and, and making sure that everything is plain language. I'm promoting this fiercely. Um, nationally, things should be, our documents, our presentations should be created so that it's in plain language. Not only is it easier for, for everyone to access, um, but also to translate. Translation mm -hmm. is so critical, but if it's in tech, it's, if tech, 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 oh, I apologize. If it's technically um, not accessible, then the translation is going to be lost in the, in, in the, in the, in the weeds. So those, those resources are, are definitely my, my go-to resources for the most part. So thank you, Doris Maldonado, for your time and your passion to the cause. It's, um, it's refreshing to know there's someone out there in the world like you. And so this is Audra Talbot. And that's it for answers this week. See you next time. Thank you. My honor and humble pleasure. Thank you. Good luck. Gracias. All right, let's 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 continue. With the school year coming to a close, it's important to take a look at what's to come for our students when schools reopen in the fall. So that's why I'd like to make some predictions. And what better way to do predictions than to bring out the, uh, to bring out the old path crystal ball. Let's take out the crystal ball and see what is in store. First question, will the pandemic close schools again? And the answer is, don't count on it. Circumstances have changed since March 2020, when schools were closed everywhere. Now there's a vaccine. 
less deadly mutations of the virus are predominant. Schools have learned how to contain outbreaks. I, I suppose the unexpected could happen, but if things continue as they have been, don't count on it. Will the shortage of teachers and staff continue? And the answer is, signs point to yes. As announced by the State Board of Education in April, the schools in our state are experiencing a critical shortage of teachers and staff in 10 teaching areas. Here are the 10 areas. Three of them involve teachers and staff who work with our children every day, special education teachers, school psychologists, speech language pathologists. The Board of Education warned us the shortage in all 10 areas is so severe, it will continue into the next academic school year. When will the learning our children lost be made up? And the answer is, reply hazy, try again. In other words, we will find out later. For individual students, there will be progress reports and report cards. And for all the students, the results of the latest round of statewide testing will be announced in the fall. So we will find out. A student's progress is something that's difficult to predict. It's easy to recognize progress when you can look back and see a track record of improvement, but looking forward, trying to see it, it's hazy at best. Will PPT meetings be held in person next year? And the answer comes back, outlook good. In fact, depending on your school district, you may have already been invited to attend an in-person PPT meeting this year. Many school districts made online meetings optional for parents this year. If all goes well, it's safe to say that this trend will continue into next year. Will schools do more to fight the student emotional health crisis? And the answer is most likely. That's because state and federal legislators have been working to enact new programs for schools to use. In school, in school health centers, training for school administrators, school teachers and staff get training too. Funding to bring in more school personnel who know how to respond to emotional distress, like schools counselors, social workers, and behavior specialists. We should start to see signs of these programs over the course of the school year next year. And of course, there will be snags, as illustrated by the Killingly Board of Education. In March, the Killingly School Board turned down a proposal to open a mental health clinic at Killingly High School at no cost to the town. Actually, they turned it down twice, even though a survey of local students showed a great need for it. The decision led to a lashback by local parents and an investigation by the State Department of Education. Nothing has been settled yet, and it's possible a mental health center will possibly open someday at Killingly High School. The takeaway here is that just because these programs exist, it doesn't mean that everyone will recognize their value. When will schools go back to normal? That's a question everyone's been asking since March 2020. And the answer is, better not tell you no. And that's because if you have to ask, you might not like the answer you get, depending on how you define normal. If normal means returning to exactly the way things were before March 2020, it's not going to happen. Public education evolves. It moves forward, not backward. The difficulties the pandemic caused will be resolved eventually, but the lessons we learned from the pandemic will be with us for a very long time. Let's take a look at some of the Q&A that has been coming in. So this is my first opportunity to look at the Q&A and chat. Um, and let's see that, well, there, there are. Yeah, so there's a parent that reached out to me um, that I had told one of my families that I have um, that is a, a native speaker, a Spanish speaking family. And um, 
the, the, one of the problems that, you know, I know the problems overall, but it's, I understand it's my right to have an interpreter if it is requested, but if I don't request it, will the school assign an interpreter to me? And, and I feel as though I don't want to rock the boat too much. And it, it, I think it, it might be something along the like, like this parents are afraid to reach out to the school because they feel as though their voice isn't being heard. That's the first thing. And they're not, they're going to these meetings and they're not understanding what's being said to them because it's all in English. So this is one of the, the things that Doris and I spoke about on our webinar that was, you know, previous to this. The, the rift in our state, just in Connecticut alone, and in Bridgeport and Hartford, um, New London, some of the, the more socioeconomically diverse towns and cities, this is one of the problems. So I don't know what you run into, Kevin, but that's, that's what, what one of my families was saying to me that they run into. Yes, I, I've run into that in, in, in the past and when working with families that speak Spanish or, or other languages, um, schools do have to make an effort <clears throat> to make sure there's a translator there if, if, if it's needed, but um, a, a lot of it is uh, about how you define translator. It, yeah. it, it is possible for someone to be fluent <clears throat> in, in, in a foreign language, yet be totally incapable of acting as a translator. A translator is someone who listens and translates and uh, outputs the translation all seemingly simultaneously. It's something that takes training. It takes more than just being able to speak a language. And while schools, you know, in a pinch may tend to pull the Spanish teacher for a PPT meeting to help with translation, um, there really is no substitute for a professionally trained translator. Correct. Yeah. And, and I find that that's things I hear from feedback too is the Spanish speaking teacher or the Spanish teacher of whatever school, the middle school, the high school should never be pulled into a meeting for that purpose at all. It's just, it's, it's unprofessional, number one. And it's something that I think our parents need to know that that's not okay. Like they can speak up to that. You shouldn't be. Audra, it looks like we've lost your video, your audio. Oh. Oh, there you go. Oh. Okay. Thank you. I have another, I have another question that was um, sent to me. It says, what document should be translated into Spanish if my native, native language is Spanish? I never get my IEP in Spanish. So for all those out there, the IEP is the individual educational plan um, that's part of the special education journey. Like you, you get this plan put in place and it's called the IEP, but it should absolutely be, it should be given to you in your, your language, especially the new IEPs coming out. That's part of the training. I think there's 10 languages that are part of the, um, the SEDS. But something I ran into when I had a conversation with one of my colleagues at CPAC was what are vital documents and, and how do we define vital? And should those, and how do you know as a parent what to ask for in Spanish? And, there's some contention around this. And so the, there's there's guidance on it. And that guidance isn't always followed. And I can speak to specific you know, cases that I have, but there was pushback about having reports or evaluations translated into the native language of the family because they don't feel as though it's their obligation to do so. So how can you have parental participation to the highest mark, if you don't have, if you're not able to read it, and then also have the feedback from the evaluator, it translated or interpreted, it, it, it's, there's such a, a drop down right there. And so that's why parents can't participate. And that's why kids fall through the cracks. So I think it's our, it's part of our responsibility our ethical responsibility to look out for these pitfalls and to teach our parents that it's okay to it's okay to speak up. You're, you're not going to be rocking the boat. And if you feel like you are, then you should ask for help and maybe have an advocate go to the meeting with you or 
you know, have someone from your community faith-based organization. Like that's what Doris was talking about. Uh, certainly. That was, the, that was the other question. Yeah. And, and when decisions are made on your behalf based on someone's um, own interpretation of what is vital to you, <clears throat> it, it, it's inherently unfair. And as a parent, I, I would expect all the documents are vital. Right. All, the, all the documents are used to help us understand our children's progress and, and appreciate what's going on at school and find ways to f follow up at home. But when you're at the mercy of someone's definition of vital, that is a barrier that leads to trouble. Yeah, it's too unspecific. Unfortunately, it's the guidance. So, sure. so sure. it's, it's and, and I think districts fall back on that and they say, well, it's the guidance. Well, it's not right. <laughs> you know, what does that mean? Yeah. Now, now, I have a question that came in earlier. My child was diagnosed by my pediatrician with ADHD. Who should I let know at the school and what should the school do for next steps? Audra, would you take a crack at that question, please? Sure. So that to me, that's a two part question. So when your pediatrician is diagnosing attention deficit hyperactivity disorder, ADHD, <clears throat> That's a medical diagnosis. And so I think that's what that's part of the lesson we really try to put forward in special education is there's a medical aspect of things from your medical community, your pediatrician, your psychiatrist, your therapist, your geneticist, whatever medical doctor, the MDs of your world, versus the educational identification for special education. And so that's the first part of it there's a difference, you know, there's kind of that, that brick wall line. So in saying that, what you should do is you should take that information the pediatrician has given to you and you need to bring it to the school. The person, the, the lead person that should know that really, if you're not in the special education world should be the general education teacher. So it'd be the teacher of your child's classroom or you could bring it to the school principal just someone in, in, in the position that can make action on that. And my belief is your next step after that, they should with due diligence, bring that to the higher ups and maybe referral to special education. But if that does not get done, it's okay to reach out to someone at the board of education to ask that exact question. Who do I talk to about getting my child evaluated for special education? They just got a medical diagnosis of ADHD. And then hopefully it'll get in the right hands and all those, those steps after that. There's, a, there's several steps after that, but that's really the first place to start. And yes, it's overwhelming and it's emotional, but it's the right thing to do to ask them to do the evaluation. Because if you don't do that, then it probably won't happen. And you're leaving it up to school to pretty much find your child's disability or exceptionality as we say these days, I say. But that's the first step, I think. Well, if anything, that shows the importance of asking questions. And as parents, we should be willing to ask questions. Um, that, that's how you learn things. Yeah. And I think that, you know, some of the drop down on that one is, for example, if you have a, a family that speaks primarily Spanish, there is a cultural kind of hold back. They don't want to ask. It's not that they don't want to ask for help. This is what Doris made very clear to me. It's that there's a, there's a cultural, they don't want to rock the boat. They, it's, it's the community. It's, it's a cultural thing which is, you know, I'm learning this from her, as you know, she said, it's embedded. But um, it's, I think it's important just to say out, out there, it's really, it, it's okay to, to ask for help for that. That's their job. That's why they're there. They got into this business of education to educate children, regular ed or special ed, I don't care. But that's why they're there. They're there to help you. So it's okay to ask. And if you need interpretation for that, you need to ask them for that. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> well, I, I see that we have reached our usual adjournment time. I want to thank everyone 
who participated, uh, everyone who, who's here and stuck with us through the technical difficulties. And of course, as always, Audra, uh -huh. thank you for everything. And answers will You're return. Welcome. Answers will return. We will see you next time. Thanks, everyone. Thank so you. Long. Good night.